Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. And in a way, I think possibly my most interesting guest so far, in as much as his story is quite extraordinary and really shocking and really upsetting. I've also, by the way, got sitting in on the, on this, this this special podcast, another previous podcast guest, Johnny Foreman. We're all in Dublin and we, we're speaking at a, a politics festival and Johnny may, because he's a journalist too, after all, Dublin Festival of Politics, organised by the Temple Bar Company. They get their plug now because they shipped us over here. Um, Johnny is a journalist and, and, and also a fan, a fellow fan of my, my guest today, so he might, might chip in. Anyway, my special guest today is Kevin Myers. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you, James. Kevin is literally my favourite Irish journalist. I've been a massive, massive fan of him for so long. His book, Watching the Door, about the Troubles and about he was he, he, he reported on the Troubles at their worst and experienced some terrible things we might talk about later on. Um, but the reason I'm here talking to him now and I've been dying to talk to him about this is he has been the victim of the most appalling SJW witch hunt style career destruction moment. One minute he was he was carrying on as before as my favorite Irish journalist writing all sorts of really interesting good stuff from I would say probably a conservative-ish libertarian perspective a sort of intelligent perspective on things like climate change on on the EU on Ireland etc etc and one night between uh, between midnight and nine o'clock in the morning he had his career totally destroyed is that a fair assessment it is actually it was shorter than the nine hours you're allowing there it probably occurred in about three hours i had written a poor column for the uh, irish edition of the sunday times uh, at the particular request of the sunday times it wasn't my choosing on the the pay rates of the bbc and it, it, i had in a, in that poor column i had written a sloppy sentence about the the jewish background of two of the women presenters i didn't say that the, the two presenters were grasping i just said that they were professionals and they as all professionals should do they minded their interest and they clearly had good agents who negotiated a, a proper package for them because what one was vanessa feltz and and uh, vanessa feltz and, and uh, winkleman um Claudia, Claudia Winkleman. Winkleman. So this was in the context of, of, of that big, well, fake furore, uh, furore, I would argue, about the differentials between the, the, the male and female journalists at the BBC. And of course, the, 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 the feminists slept on that one as a, as, a, as a great story. And you were, you were making the point that there were these two particular female journalists who got themselves a pretty good deal. And you'd mentioned on Pass on that they were Jewish. I, I, I would say that 10, 20 years ago, it would have been a fair enough, fair enough comment. I mean... I think we ought to ought to say before we go on that you are not you're not um you're not anti-Semitic. Not at all. Now, just to get it absolutely plain, um, I am perhaps the most foremost foremost d- defender of Israel in the Irish media. Yeah. I, mean, I have been um, you know vilified for my defence of Israel in through thick and thin for the last twenty years, and I'm the only person who repeatedly defends Israel whenever Israel re- retaliates in Gaza and so on and so forth. So that um, I felt free, particularly since the Israeli embassy has a, a soft spot for me, I felt free to refer to these uh, women's um, backgrounds. It was stupid of me, but it was... Well, it was stu- stu- stupid it, it, with, with hindsight, but actually... At the just time, look, it passed through all the editorial filters in Dublin and London. Seven people read it in London. Two people read it in Dublin. No one said, hold on, you shouldn't be talking about that. Anyway... Somebody accessed this column. They had to get through the paywall in London uh, at quarter past twelve that morning. We're talking about the only the Irish edition of the midnight. newspaper, yes, so which nobody in England would normally read. No, for, well, I wouldn't sake. have thought so. So somebody accessed it, got through the paywall, and raised this issue of um, I'm referring to these two uh, women ha- having Jewish backgrounds, and within an hour or two hours, people had gone through on Twitter different columns I had written from the 1980s, assembling a, a, an entirely fictitious uh, picture 
of this anti-Semite, so that in 1989 I defended the right of David Irving to speak at Trinity College Dublin. This turned me into a Holocaust denier, when in fact I'm a Holocaust affirmer. I have written over 20 columns dis describing the Holocaust for Irish readers who I felt didn't know enough about them. So I was turned into the opposite of what I was. I'm a pro-Jewish pro and I got turned into anti-Semite. I'm pro-Israel and I got turned into an anti-Zionist. I am anti-Nazi and I got turned into a Holocaust denier. And by three o'clock, my international reputation had been destroyed by the assembly of this fictitious picture, but using you know, the right component parts. So that when I, at nine o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from my page editor in Dublin saying, we're in deep shit here. There is a storm, an internet storm, and you, you look as if you're not gonna survive it. I said, that's not possible. And it, he was right, I didn't survive it. Um, within, uh, I have never spoken to Martin Ivans in my life. Uh, he hadn't spoken to me that morning. Martin Ives is, is Martin the editor Ives of the, editor of the Sunday Times. Times the, of the, the English edition of the yeah. Sunday Times. He didn't employ me initially, uh, but he did sack me, and he, he announced that I would never work for the Sunday Times again. Now, this is the sentence you impose on a rapist, a paedophile, an unrepentant terrorist. It is not something you do to somebody who's made a small error of judgment, and that error of judgment has been sanctioned, authorized, by at least seven other employees in your organization. Yes. And I was the only person who was sacked and sacked for all time. And I was made the great big visible scapegoat for um, something that I still cannot explain. And this is a lifelong um, a ban. And what happened in Ireland was that all the people who hate Israel yes. were able to say, I'm an anti-Semite, I'm, I'm a terrible person and a misogynist. So the, the a misogynist, because I took the side of um, people who I can argue well for themselves, now this has turned into misogyny. I mean, it's, it, you can't analyze it because it's immune to analysis. Yes. It's, it's hysteria. But the, the primary target wasn't Israel at this point or, or, or anti-Semitism. It was Kevin Myers. Yeah. And they got him. They, they, got, got, they you, got him. They got you and... I'm as I'm as shocked as you are. I I, I I mean I have read this this story has been so distorted and misrepresented. I've I've read in the Sunday Telegraph that you were a Holocaust denier. The Sunday Telegraph, which is a conservative newspaper, that if, if there's any newspaper which ought to be standing up for freedom of speech and truth, accurate representation of conservative judgments, uh, journalists in particular. I would have thought it was Sunday Telegraph. They, they'd know about your history. They'd know about well, your Well, they past. should do because I worked for them for 10 years. I was a columnist for Sunday Telegraph oh, for 10 years. Oh, my God. So that's something that so easily, well, you just make a phone call. They should hang their heads. I don't know who wrote those words. They should bloody well hang you their know, heads I stopped in reading newspapers that week and haven't read newspapers since then, hardly. Um, uh, but the, the Sunday Telegraph was, I employed, was employed by Dominic Lawson for the Sunday Telegraph. Right. And I wrote a lot about the Second Dominic World Dominic Lawson, who is Jewish, who I think probably wouldn't employ an anti-Semite if... <laughs> when he was uh, uh, being attacked on, on, on grounds of his um, Jewish background, uh, Nigella rang me and said, look, what should we do about this? And I said, calm down, first of all. Uh, it'll be okay. This is anti-Semitic filth, and no one pays any attention to that anymore. Don't react. Don't say anything. So when they were having problems with anti-Semites, they turned to me. They looked for counsel from me, and Nigella rang me a couple of days later and said, you were right. It's gone away. It wasn't something we should have reacted to. We didn't, and that was good advice. So they took the advice from somebody they knew to be pro-Jewish and pro-Israeli. I, I think, dear listener, if, if it seems like we're laying on with a trowel, that, that Kevin's absolute lack of anti-Semitism and his absolute pro-Israel stance, it's because we live in such weird times that one needs to say this stuff, because otherwise I'm, I'm sure that, that there are going to be people out there who are going to think, well, he, he made that terrible remark, he should never have made it, throw him to the wolves. I find it very, very weird that, not just weird, actually disgusting, that... Most of the people who are taking the most satisfaction from your, your destruction are the kind of people who loathe Israel, who, who secretly applaud, applaud the anti-Semitic um, stance of the Labour Party, for example. People, people in momentum, 
for example. Absolutely, momentum yeah. is the perfect, the perfect group they of people who would loathe they me. They would and, hate and, you. Know, yes, yeah. Now, the, 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 the Irish Jews, as one, just about came to my defense. The Jewish Representative Council said, this man is a friend of ours, he's a friend of Israel, he is not an anti-Semite, and that's why um, uh, not merely did they issued that statement, they invited me along with the Jewish Historical Society to chair the day-long celebration of the Balfour Declaration, which is why the Israeli ambassador took me out to lunch the other day. Did he? Yeah, and now he's a, he's a new ambassador, I hadn't met so him he, before. So the Israeli ambassador went for lunch with a known Holocaust. Yeah, that? yeah, and so we, we had a wonderful time. So we, we met at 12, we finished at 4. Yeah. Just talking to one another. Great, I became an instant friend. You mentioned earlier, and I was, I was shocked by this, I have to say, but I think we ought to name names here, because I, th I think there is something rank in the state of Denmark right now. Um, the, something rotten in the state of Denmark, rather. Um, wh which is that one of the guys who leapt on this, uh, your column, was the editor of the Financial Times, Lionel Barber. Now, I'd like to know what Lionel Barber is doing uh, cruising around the internet at, at 10 past midnight, whenever it was, looking for... St somebody must have tipped him off. Well, this is the question. Why were so many people accessing my column in the, f the early hours of the uh, Sunday morning. I, I didn't know it was available online that early. I thought it would come, come online at 7 o'clock in the morning. The fact it was available that line at that time came as a complete shock to me. But it went around the, the world, and d different people were c composing different versions of my life so that when I woke up, an entirely new and completely fictitious Kevin Myers existed who knocked out the real Kevin Myers completely for all time. And uh, yeah, Lionel Barber was a participant in that. Why? Why destroy, and I am destroyed, yeah. irreversibly destroyed, why destroy the only pro-Jewish journalist in Ireland? What's the point? Well, I would, I would imagine from Lionel Barber, the Financial Times, that is the kind of the liberal elite that people like you and me write articles castigating. They're Davos man, they're the European super state, they're politically correct. Yeah, I, you I, name it. Yeah, yeah, you've got I mean, it all every, there. Everything yeah. we loathe. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I'm not going to I'm not going to disguise my loathing for these things, these organizations, these rejections of common but sense. But rather than engage with your arguments, and this is, and this is, this is how the left rolls now, and, I, and I would, I'm afraid I'd, I'd, I'd include the FT in that. They don't want to engage with our arguments because our arguments are inconvenient and often laden with truths that they, that they cannot counter. Therefore, they destroy the man rather than the argument. Yeah, I mean, if it was just me, you'd say it's just me, but that this isn't the case anymore. We know uh, this is how this hunting pack operates. It doesn't just bring somebody down. It destroys them if they possibly did, can. Did you, you, you mentioned that you'd had some analysis done on these the emails because this this is I, I think it is so weird a, a column that only appears in an Irish newspaper leapt upon by lots of people on Twitter was it was yeah a Twitter no, I, I, would, I don't tweet I don't know how to I don't know how to access these things it's so, a terrible place yeah but uh, at the uh, I paid I paid a, an analyst a young woman analyst um, two hundred euros to do the uh, analysis online through yeah. the the, the, uh, the that morning. And it is chilling. It's, it's actually nauseating um, because it's me they're talking about. And when you see these lies being assembled about you and you know the outcome, the outcome is, 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 is ruinous. You know at the end of this tweet, I will have no career, no reputation internationally, no. that I'll be vilified in, in America and in Britain as an anti-Semite. And it's disgusting and nauseating and terrifying to see you being me, me being yeah. spoken about like that. And it's me, Kevin Myers having my life, my reputation, everything I have, have done as a journalist, my entire history has been turned upside down to create this Frankenstein's monster, which is not me. And what is really shocking was the hatred these people showed towards me, and they don't know who I am. Did you find they had anything in common, these people? Did you actually analyze James, who they were? James, I wasn't able to stomach it. When you see this, 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 this bile right. with you being um, that's the target and you know vile anti-semitic rant that was yeah. the tweet that was being transported so the JK Rowling picked it up uh, and she's got that's, 15 that's always million, the kiss of death yeah, yeah 15 million followers in America and yes. one of her followers is is um, Chelsea Clinton so these this is exponential this is the left-wing bully pu pulpit yeah. and, and it's, it's an very powerful it's an exponential thing so I don't know what time she participated but Rowling was involved 
And it's the same week she had to retract an allegation she'd made about uh, Donald Trump. But she obviously wasn't going to retract anything about me, and I haven't been in a position to, to uh, do anything about her. But with that weight of loathing and prejudice and falsehood being directed against me while I slept, my life was destroyed. I really hope that there's somebody rich, American and conservative listening to this who might help you out, because actually, I think it, I think it is appalling. Um, particularly, um, if anyone's Irish, American and Catholic, Kevin's one of yours, so, it's, so you want to look after him. And, and for, for, I mean, we conservatives, we need to, we need to st stand up it against this It doesn't happen, you see. We're, not, we're, we're, we're more anarchic did, conservatives. Did you, not get, did you not get much support from No, from no absolutely uh, not. You've got Douglas Murray, I know, in The Spectator. Was that it? Uh, no, I mean, there was a, a columnist in the, um, in the Irish Times, uh, but generally speaking, most journalists were really happy, Irish journalists were happy to see me destroyed. So that would tell me and tell you and tell our listeners that I'm re regarded as an outsider in, in Ireland. You did, you, I, I'm afraid to say your journalism did stick out like a sore thumb, both for the uh, elegance of your prose and the integrity of your arguments and, and, and your politics, which are frankly not left-wing. Um, you, you, you do speak for things that I think we should all value, like freedom of speech and... Um, uh, limited government and uh, not not unreasonable. I'm not talking about far right. I'm talking about this, sensible this is, stuff. This is sensible stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's not far right. I don't even know what far right no, means no, anymore. I, I don't, don't know what right and left means anymore. I'm not sure what these these terms have much meaning. But I do believe in free speech right up to the point where you are, um, but no further. Not to the beyond the point where you're inciting hatred. But you you do have to be allowed to irritate people and anchor people. Well, I just hope that hope that everyone Google's your columns and just sees what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I was a massive fan. And Johnny, I think you were, you were a massive, massive fan, were you not? I'm a great fan of, uh, of watching The Door and, and, and of Kevin's columns um, in general. Um, so I was amazed when I saw uh, when the controversy happened. Um, I did think the original column was, was uh, unfortunate and ill-judged, I think, is a term that, that people have used. No doubt um, about I that. I mean, it sort of, and it does, it, it is a, it is a, it is a, I guess, a traditional anti-Semitic trope, isn't it? The, 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 it? But I don't think, as I say, anyone who actually knows your work, which, which I did, um, would think, well, okay, he said that, but it isn't, it's not, you know, this is the idea that you are, you're a sort of lifelong anti-Semitic, it's ridiculous. And the problem with it, then the Holocaust denial stuff, again, that came from a, column I think earlier in the 2000s wasn't it where you said the headline was there was no holocaust I'm a holocaust denier which but you were saying it in the context of it, you weren't actually you were saying it ironically as, as I recall that's uh, right and the, the, the problem is that uh, if you are working to an agenda not me I'm talking about my enemies they are disingenuous when they take that headline which I didn't write I had yeah. d didn't know it was going to appear, and I was very angry when it did appear yeah. because I knew it could start misunderstandings. But if you are, uh, um, anyway, literate journalist and can read things, you say, oh, this, is, this is not what I intend to say. I, I'm certainly trying to get people's attention. And do I believe that there was a single thing, a hollow cost as a, a burning, a single burning, which, you know, hollow is the same, essentially, etymologically the same word as whole, and cost means burn. What were the, did, was the final solution brought about by a single burning event? No, the, it wasn't because it was done in massacres, it was done in people being burnt to death in their synagogues, it would people being flogged to death in the Hearts Mountains. It was every kind of evil that mankind could devise. Far from being a Holocaust denier, I'm a Holocaust attester, and people have to be told time and time again that the details of this monstrosity, the greatest monstrosity in Europe's history, and perhaps the greatest monstrosity in the world's history. So I'm unequivocal about this. Yes. And, uh, and so for me to be called a Holocaust denier is n not merely revolting, but it's an insult to those people who were consumed in the Holocaust. Yes, I mean, the thing is, it's a sort of, you know, so they were able to take that headline, um, some possibly risky things, some pr provocative ways of, of, of making those arguments made before and string it all together. And it did seem ironic to me at the time, as I'm not someone who's, you know, that avid a reader of the Irish press, but I do read it enough to see that a lot of the people who jumped on the bandwagon, you know, were sort of, quite notoriously people who are obviously not in the least philo-Semitic or, or, and certainly not pro-Israel. Um, and of course they were thrilled to be able to do it. I mean, the, things, it's very, the tragic thing is that in a sense um, you gave them the ammunition to, to, to do this stuff. Um, 
And of course, they were waiting. I mean, that's the thing. You, you, it does you, look you as had as a lot of enemies waiting. for a long time. Yeah, it does look as if they were waiting. I don't understand. Haven't been able to explain to myself, never mind to, to you two and to our listeners, how this international uh, group of people were apparently ready and waiting to destroy me in the, the early hours of that Sunday morning. That is beyond explanation, any explanation that I can provide. Well, I mean, one of the things is, I, do think, I mean, my impression is that sort of it just, that's just the way social media works. I mean, I just think that sort of, you know, the people who don't know, they don't know who you are. It sounds awful. Um, it's a way of showing that, you know, I, I don't think, you know, whether it's Chelsea Clinton or all those sort of people, it's not, you know, there's no conspiracy here. It's just that it's just people, they see this, it sounds awful. You've seen it on a tweet. And that's the problem in the world. The, the social media world is, is astonishing because it's so unforgiving and so quick and so powerful. Yeah, and but it, people did access columns back to the yeah. 1980s. So they, they were going back nearly 30 years. Well, your enemies looking, in Ireland were very, I mean... Yeah. But these, this wasn't in Ireland. This really? was else, uh, elsewhere. This was... Almost, ever, almost certainly was some doing stuff from coming from London. Mm. Somebody was using a search engine to find out a line here, a line there. So it was not just in newspaper articles. Um, it was in a, a, a lines from a, a memoir that I've written. So somebody at three o'clock in the morning had access to line in, in yes. my memoir. And I remember reading some of the columns. I, remember, I think it was somebody called Lynch writing about you, going like, oh, he's notorious. I had to see my Holocaust and he's this and he's that and he's a racist and he's a sexist and it's obviously I thought okay there's one of yours there's clearly one of the people who yeah. hated you for years he seems also as being um, you know too pro-British um, and all that stuff too and, and by some but I'm unashamed about what I am I've never yeah. denied I was born in England I don't hate anyone because of you know yeah. because of their national origins yeah. or, and that's you know that's true from wherever you come but I'm not going to fall into kind of stereotypes because you're Irish or because you're British or because you're African or whatever you kind yeah. of be, be a particular sort of person um I, I like to think I'm, and in fact, I, I know I am a tolerant person, an open minded, but that means I also have to tell the truth. If you're a tolerant of, of falsehoods, then you, you, you're not tolerant, you know, you're, you're an intolerant person. So I, I do tell uncomfortable truths, particularly, for example, one of the racist things is my uh, profound criticisms of aid to Africa, which has been a disaster, it's been a catastrophe for Africa. And it's going to be a catastrophe for Europe within a generation, too. Yes, so we have to have a grown-up conversation about this. But any attempt to do this ends up being called, you being called racist. Yes, I mean, I was aware of your stuff on that because I wrote a book on, on, uh, on foreign aid, actually, funny enough, called Aiding and Abetting. And I remember seeing there are very few people who actually write about foreign aid in an, what I would say is an appropriately sceptical and critical way. Um, and, of course, it's very controversial, and especially... Um, here in Ireland, but it's uh, it is interesting. I think one of the things that, that struck me, I guess, is that sort of you know, regardless of um, of I mean, of those of those two columns, um, in a sense, is that how you know, I mean, it's sort of well, I wasn't surprised. I, I mean, you had a lot of enemies, probably probably in, in, in other places as well. Um, but people are only too pleased to jump on someone, especially someone who's who's had success or. or you know, uh, uh, renown or controversy, and they're only too pleased to jump on them and, oh, see, look, he's a terrible person. This is, the, uh, this is the, 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 the elite. I mean, the ordinary people in Ireland understand exactly what I was trying to say. Whenever I, I mean, still, I go to a supermarket, people will come over and shake me by the hand and say, what's happened to you has been shocking. So uh, th this, is, this is the same division that we saw in America in the Trump election and the Brexit vote. Ordinary people think one way and the elites think the other. And the ordinary people have been amazing. They come over and they're so uh, enthusiastically pro, not pro my opinions, but the, they're in favor of, of the right of freedom of speech, which means the right to be wrong. Yes. The, the, and that's the most important right of all, the right to be wrong. I think it's absolutely right. And, 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 you can, and one of the things that, that um, must be very creepy and painful for you is that, of course, inevitably you get people who are on the hard left or extreme right who do go, oh, you know, who are real anti semites Oh, it's great, Kevin Myers is one of us. I mean, it's very easy to find that on the internet. Like, oh, look, they've done for him too. You know, you do see that. Um, and I think you've got to be careful about that too, James. I only got Not to one. sound like those people because um, there is a bit of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, every, well, when you say like, oh, this mysterious thing happened where everyone jumped on him, and that sounds a little bit conspiratorial and sounds a bit like, and there are, there's a lot of stuff on the internet going, oh, it's great, Kevin Myers is one of us. He knows about 
the power of the Jews and all this sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, there is. That one of yeah. the things that is a falsehood, and yeah. I heard repeatedly in Ireland, you know, the power of the Jewish lobby. There is no Jewish lobby. This is a fiction. There is anyone who knows Jews. The first thing that Jews will do is disagree with one another. That, that there is no united Jewish lobby out to get Kevin Myers yeah. or anybody else yeah. or to stop criticism of Israel. It just can, it doesn't work. Can I just say, actually, Johnny, I, I totally don't buy that line. I, 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 it hadn't even occurred to me that this was a Jewish conspiracy. This, this is very much a, a, a left-wing conspiracy. Hadn't, he, hadn't even crossed my brain. I'm surprised it crossed yours, actually. Anyway, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole. I'm, I'm going to talk more about um, SJW tactics in the next section. You're listening to me, James Dellingpole, with Kevin Myers. More in a moment. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News' Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with AWR Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash AWR. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. Welcome back to the to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very, very, very special and interesting guest, Kevin Myers, and also featuring Johnny Foreman, Jonathan Foreman, a, a previous podcast guest, a fellow journalist and fellow Kevin Myers fan. In the gap between the b- b- between um, this section and the last section, we were having this c- this kind of anxious anxious debate. I was sort of pouring cold water o- over Johnny, having brought up the idea that one might think that that uh, this was some kind of dark Jewish conspiracy, because I'd only thought of it as a left wing conspiracy. But then, actually, this is the kind of environment we're living now, where we all have to. I, I'm, I'm sure there are historical precedents for this. Probably this is probably what it was like in, I don't know, um, communist behind the, uh, the Iron Curtain, where you have to question yourself at every turn. Am it's I like guilty? Stasi. No, it's like living with the Stasi, because everyone in any... There are four of us sitting at this table. All four would be working for Stasi and all pretending to not to be working for Stasi. So we, we live in this kind of... We live in a modern Stasi culture. Do you think Jonathan's so, Stasi? <laughs> yeah, we all no, Stasi. No, I don't know. <laughs> And, and so th- there isn't a conspiracy, a Jewish conspiracy, of this I know, of this I'm completely confident. Right. But obviously some Jews will, f- will, will believe that I'm an anti-Semite and they'll be rightly insulted at the notion that an anti-Semite is be- writing, but they won't even know what I've written. And they, they might uh, well, inadvertently have participated in, in, in my destruction, but the destruction wasn't done from a Jewish point of view, it was done from a left-wing, yes. anti-libertarian I think, point I think, of view. I think we're, we're definitely... Um, in agreement on that one, the the um, one of the mistakes you made, of course, apart apart from uh, apart from sort of <laughs> your t- your turn of phrase in the original column, one of the big mistakes you made, of course, was apologising, because you've done nothing wrong, and what the uh, th- I, I don't know whether you've ever come across Vox Day. No, Vox Day has written a very good book, which which um, everyone, particularly on our side of the argument, should read, called SJWs Always Lie, yep. and it's about how. The mob, the left-wing mob, social justice warriors, as they're known, um, they hunt in packs, and what they what you see this time and again. For example, with the hounding of Tim Hunt. Do you remember mm. the um, the scientist who who gave a perfectly ordinary speech, actually quite pro women, women in science, and ended up being misrepresented and having his career all but destroyed by the the vengeful harpies of the of the internet, and. In every case, what they want to do is to get an admission of guilt yeah. from you. Because once you've, once you've expressed your guilt, that shows you're guilty. It's odd. It ought, to, it ought to mean the opposite. It ought to mean... It used to be the opposite. Yeah. That was the PR, standard PR th- advice that people would give. And I have a very good friend of mine who's in PR. I said, look, th- this can be cleared up. If you apologise, uh, it'll kill Lol. it. Uh, yeah. And it's just not true. But I, I had, when I appeared on radio, I hadn't slept for two nights. And I was hallucinating with fatigue. And um, the broadcast went down, down OK, and I did apologize. So, well, let's put it to bed. Uh, uh, it didn't because an apology feeds the, this, this frenzy. It, it doesn't, it doesn't it kill does it. It does feed the monster. And it, it, what was particularly deadly for me was the Irish Prime Minister, Taoiseach, as we call him, Leo Varadkar, that afternoon denounced me as an anti-Semite and as, as a misogynist. And that, and that killed me. 
That went round the world. The, the, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister of Ireland and Deputy Prime Minister Francis Fitzgerald, whom when I, we last met, we kissed. Now she had the opportunity to denounce me as a misogynist and an anti-Semite, and as did the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, and they both did. And that, that destroyed whatever benefits I might have accrued from that radio interview. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that even though you, you, as you were you defended by the, the, I guess it's called the Jewish Council of Ireland, that doesn't make any difference. I mean, that's one of the things that's so astonishing, is the people who ought to, you know, the, 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 who really know, who know your career and who know you and are, it is, the, I guess, the official Jewish organization. What, what do they say doesn't matter? Doesn't matter, and that's mm. anti-Semitism. That's anti that is purest anti-Semitism. If people continue to call me an anti-Semite after the Jewish representative Council of Ireland said this man is not an anti-Semite, he's a friend of Jews and a friend of Israel, if people then continue to ignore them, then that's a definition of anti-Semitism. So my critics then were guilty of anti-Semitism. This is what a, a number of American Jews living in Ireland who've been very forthright in my defense are saying, look, we know who the anti-Semites are. They're the ones who are ignoring the experts on this, and the experts are Jews. And if Jews say, I'm okay, then as far as on anti-Semitism, then that's, that's the final word. But no, the Taoiseach and the, or the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, after the Representative Council said, this man is not an anti-Semite, then denounced me as an anti-Semite and a misogynist, because you always throw that in. I'm sorry they didn't manage xenophobe as well and possibly Islamophobe as well, because these are words, just words of abuse these people always throw in. It's just, you know, faggots on a fire. Yes, and it's a way of, then you're sort of de delegitimized and it's, um, and it's a problem because you've seen, yeah, I've seen it's a scene with, 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 a, with a certain amount of horror. Um, it's very difficult to know what to do about it, that stuff, because apologi not apologizing is bad and apologizing is also bad. I mean, there's, there's no, it, yeah. it's very difficult. Well, Vox Day is absolutely uncompromising a bit about this you you do not uh, apologize Fox says, because, right but the thing mm -hmm. is you if you're dealing with anti-semitism it is the most loathsome force it's a real force in the world it That's animates you know so much of the stuff in the middle east it animates uh, much of the labor party and it, it just cannot be ignored it, just lots of things you can be ignored but uh, anti the allegation of anti-semitism cannot be ignored no uh, and we do live in time. I, I, one of the, the big ideological developments in my lifetime, since in the last 20 years, certainly, has been the increasing social acceptability of anti-Semitism among, among the intellectual class. When I was at, when I was at university, anti-Semitism was, was pretty much, much dead. We'd got over that period in the sort of... In the, in the 1970s, for example, it was still... It was still fashionable among the upper classes to refer to a jaguar as a Jew's canoe, for example. Never and, heard uh, that. Yeah, but th things like that. There was there was a sort of ingrained upper class anti-Semitism uh, that that has disappeared. But what we now find in the Labour Party, particularly, I mean, you, at Oxford University, you had the case where members of the Student Labour Society were hounding Jews in the streets, uh, uh, J J Jewish undergraduates, really blatant stuff you've got most of Labour's Muslim MPs flagrantly engaging in anti-semitism on the internet and I'm referring it's a to, real problem yeah I'm referring to the the final solution the Holocaust the murder of millions of Jews as the millions of anti, of Zionists mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the new word yes yeah, the new word you, you don't ah it's all right they're killing yeah. Zionists you know so, I mean, it is really a shocking phenomenon in the modern world, which is why I had to confront it. I couldn't, I could ignore any other allegation, but the anti-Semitic thing, I, I couldn't ignore. What about here in Ireland? I mean, people talk about, what is anti-Semitism like in Ireland? I mean, I've heard about, you, you, you get a strong sense, I mean, it's not, not a pro-Israel country. Some of the well-known Irish journalists covering the Middle East, I'm not going to mention any names, but one is a famous woman who works for the BBC. Or the Gern. Uh, you know, have, uh, you know are fabulous journalists too. The, um, but there's a lot of, but there's, you do get a lot of, um, I mean, I remember in, in Joyce, I think it, in Ulysses, there's a line where they talk about anti-Semitism, he goes, oh, we haven't got a Jewish problem in Ireland because we never let them in. I can't remember who said that. Yeah, that is a line in Ulysses, but of course yeah. the Irish government, the Muslims in Irish government and the people who, um, the only people who allow Jews in would, would have been the British, British government. Yes, so, um, but anti-Semitism, every Jew in Ireland says this to me, anti-Semitism is not a feature of Irish life. It, it's, it's regarded as, would be regarded as deplorable and uncouth and barbaric. Right. 
And, uh, and successive Israeli ambassadors have, have reported to me that they're always gratified and heartened by the fact that all Jews in Ireland just about um, con confess to there being, or proudly boast that there is very little anti-Semitism in Ireland, virtually none. But there is this paradoxical thing, there's a very profound dislike of Israel. Now, I can't square that particular circle. It's very odd because it you thought, you know, becoming the, both being independent from the British and all that stuff, it's a yeah, strange phenomenon. Yeah, but it is victim-loving. Victim and it's, it, the, the Palestinians are seen to be uh, the victims and the, 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 the Israelis are seen to be the, the oppressors. And as I was saying at, when I was talking to the, um, uh, to the uh, Balfour commemoration t two weeks ago, um, I, I was talking to a cabinet minister, an Irish cabinet minister, who said, well, why are you so pro-Israeli? I've been to a Palestinian refugee camp and I've seen the conditions those people are living. And I said, have you been to um, the uh, refugee camp in India? Um, and he said, no, I didn't know, know there was a refugee camp in India. And I said, there wasn't, because the 12 million to 14 million people were displaced in India at the time of partition, and the is Indians assimilated them all. And I, I said, have you been to the re refugee camps in, in Germany to see the, the, the millions there. And he said, there aren't any refugee camps in Germany. I said, that's right, because at the same time as the, um, the creation of Israel, 14 million Germans were expelled from Romania and Poland and, and, and the Soviet Union, and they weren't put in, 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 in refugee camps. They were assimilated in, in Germany. The only people who don't assimilate their brothers are Arabs. And that's why these people are in the refugee camps, because the Arabs have refused to assimilate the Palestinians. There wouldn't be a problem if the Arabs had lived up to their professions of brotherliness and ceased to warehouse these people in, in camps and assimilated them, as it happened in Europe and in India. And he said, God, I'd never thought of it like that. It's simple, isn't it? Well, you could, see, you could see why the left hates you so much, because those arguments are pretty powerful, and they, cut, they haven't got an answer for them, so therefore they have to destroy another ground. Can I say, by the way, just backtracking a moment, you boys, asking yourself, why can it be that, that, that the Irish hate Israel? Duh! It's because Ireland is a, is a, is a painfully liberal left country, and Israel is our boss. In the, we love Israel. Israel is, represents all the things that the three of us love. It's about free markets. It's, it, 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 it's about defending its citizens' rights. It's about a strong military. It's about not taking any shit from the bad guys. That's why we love Israel. That's why the left hates them, because they are everything that, that, that the left wants to undermine and destroy. That's pretty accurate, actually. <laughs> um, Ireland, uh, Ireland swapped Catholicism for liberal leftism, and, and, that's, and Irish Catholicism was as intolerant as liberal leftism is. Thank you for segueing neatly without my even having to bother asking the question. So I've been in, in Dublin for a, a few days now, and I, I last came to Dublin about 25 years ago, when it was a very different, different city. Um, it was sort of more run down. It was definitely more Irish. And I, I went on, on your RTE one uh, earlier, earlier in the week to talk on the Sean O'Rourke show. And I think I rather wrong-footed and upset it, set him by asking him a question because he was having a go at me about Brexit and um, I can't remember what I exactly said but um, I said look you seem to be pretty big on independence in this country you know I've, I've seen some of the memorials and what happened in 1916 and and, and your, your boys um, fighting against against the British for your for your freedom so what is it that you why did you exchange all this freedom to become I didn't use this word, but it would have been a good word. You've essentially become a satrapy of, of, of this European communitarian superstate, which has sucked out all your identity. The European Union is in the business of, unlike the Romans, for example, the, one of the reasons the Roman Empire was so successful was that it allowed it, it, its conquered territories to keep many of their own, uh, uh, their own customs. It, it of, uh, often kept, kept the, the gods of the individual re regions, and it promoted the tribal chiefs. The European Union wants, to, it seems to me, wants to erase every last piece of cultural identity of its subjugate nations. And nowhere 
is this more obvious than Ireland about? The only thing you've got left of the land of, of, of Yeats and, and Singh and Oscar Wilde and all your great writers and, and before that, you know, the, the land that produced the Book of Kells. All you've got left, pretty much, is people playing the Irish fiddle in theme pubs in the Temple Bar area for, 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 for tourists who seem to outnumber the actual Irish people. Is that a fair judgment? Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very succinct one. It's not entirely fair, but it's, it's within the succinctness, it's, it's, it's quite accurate enough. The, 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 the problem is, of course, that Ireland has never really established its own separate sovereignty. It moved from the British Empire to the, the, uh, to the Roman Empire, that's the Roman Catholic Empire, and its laws were Catholic laws, essentially. Uh, and when we moved f into the European Union, we, we then moved to embrace the new Rome of the Treaty of Rome. And we are determined to prove ourselves to be more European than, than, than the British. Now, the, the facts are that, that our primary trading partner is Britain and the United States. Our primary trade is still outside the European Union. But we like to pretend that somehow or other we are more European. It's gratifying to think this is what we really are, that we're better Europeans and therefore better people than, than the British. That only goes so far because that takes us to the horribly thorny problem of the border. And you know what we have in common is the United Kingdom has a land border with only one country in the world. And the Republic of Ireland has a land um, border with only one country in the world, and that, that is respectively United Kingdom and Ireland. So we are shackled together like two prisoners who escaped from a chain gang. And we are, we, whatever we do, we are bound to operate, cooperate together. No matter how much we like or dislike one another, that's our future. Well, uh, speaking as an Englishman, I, I like you lot. I, I mean, I, I, I accept that a bit like the Scots, a bit like the Welsh, a bit like the Aussies, a bit like every, every country in the world that has been part of our empire or our commonwealth or whatever. You all hate us because you've got that chippy thing of... Nobody, of no, Ireland, pe Irish people do not hate the English. One of the things that is really mystifying is if I go to a, 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 a London bank... Uh, and want to change money, they will ask me, is Dublin in the United Kingdom or not? P people in England simply don't know anything about Ireland. They don't hate the Irish. No, we they don't. Just, they have no feelings about the Irish at all. But and what about is, you towards what, us, then? No, not used to be. Used to be, but it's not a feature now. What, what is a feature is this, well, you've already identified the liberal left thing, and the other thing is this kind of piety. It's all to do with piety. It's all to do with sanctimoniousness. It's all about feeling good. Is that we're good Europeans? Now, if you have this unchallenging approach to to affairs, to policy, if you don't use intellect and you, but instead use emotions, you're always going to go for the option that makes you feel good about yourself. Now, I often come to conclusions about policy which makes me the conclusions make me feel deeply unhappy because I don't like the outcome, but they are the intellectually only way to, 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 to conclude the, the problem. The, the, the factors that I put assemble means that, for example, I don't like the consequence of cutting aid to Africa. It seems heartless, but it's the only way for Africa to proceed. Now, it, it sounds horrible, but it, it, it is the way to go. And it's, it's, you know, it's been cruel to be kind. And, and that's what we have to be Don't as Don't forget, adults. you've got Dambisa Moyo on your side. And Dambisa Moyo is from, where is she? She's Zambian. 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 So, she, so she, she, she is Zambian, uh, yes. It, it, it's not just Dambisa. I mean, one of the fun, interesting things about, about foreign aid, especially to Africa, um, I mean, particularly to Africa, is that, I remember, you know, whenever I, I used to do a lot of debates for after, um, and before and after aiding and abetting, and one of the things that's so striking is when you see the, the pro-aid side, everyone doing it. Uh, on the pro-aid side will be a white, you know, British or Irish or American person. And the people on the other side saying stop sending the money are um, quite likely to be Africans. I mean, you've got, you know, it's not just Mbisa Moyo, it's George Aite, it's, um, you know, there's a whole number of people from various different African countries who are going, yes, I know this is very good for you and, and making yourselves feel better. And in you, you can go on about how, you, how even if it doesn't work, your intentions are good. Said, but to us, your intentions really don't matter. The results matter to us. And please stop funding our dictators. I mean, we're in this, this last week, Mugabe fell. Mugabe would have felt fallen years ago without food aid and other aid from That's the UK and right. other countries. That's absolutely right. And um, the, the Mugabe was sustained by UN aid mm. and other aid. I mean, it, it's ludicrous. UK aid. And, yeah, and UK yeah. aid. And, and food coming from Zambia and food coming from South Africa. I mean, the, the class 
classic example is Ethiopia. Before its famine in, in 1980, it, it had a population of 35 million. It's now 103 million. This is what famine does to an African country. Its population tripled. It, Britain's population in 1870 was 35 million. It still hasn't reached 70 million. It hasn't doubled in about 150 years. Ethiopia's population tripled in something like 35 years. And that's because of aid. And that's because they don't have to live up to the iron rule of consequence that the rest of us have to live, to, up, live up to. And this thing is not even discussed in the United Nations. Do you United think it's that? You, do, you don't think it's, the, it's um, decline in infant mortality, which is partly because of good aid? I mean, the, well, the medical the stuff. Point. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. If you lived by the iron rule of consequence, you will mind how many children you produce into this world. If you know that your children will be fed, or you suspect they'll be fed regardless of your behavior, then you'll continue to have um, sex that's going to produce children. That's what people do. If they know that in the long term, their children will be fed by kind, kindly outside agencies, they'll behave irresponsibly. That's interesting. I always thought it was much more the fact that just people where they used to, you know, where they had high infant mortality, you had 10 children because you're going to lose eight of them. And people never really got out of the habit of it. But that's a very interesting, that's a really interesting Well, idea. they know that they, every society knows that they, in Africa society knows that they'll be rescued from their own delinquencies. Can I just, just mention something that I, I, I took a couple of Uber journeys the other day in, in London. Cuban? Uber, Uber. Uber Uber cab journeys. And in both cases, my drivers were Somalis. And I, I always like a good conversation with, um, with immigrant drivers to find out their history and stuff. And I got talking to, about, talking to one of them about all sorts of things. And I said, do you have any children? He'd, he'd been in England, by the way, for 15 years. He'd, um, and he said, yes, I have six. And I was thinking, you know, mate, I'm glad you've got, got six children. But actually those of us who actually have to live by the consequences of of, of uh, we don't get prop, don't expect to be propped up by a welfare state those of us who actually have to worry about paying for our children's education and stuff we would consider six children a luxury beyond measure and you are you mate are taking the piss but yeah that's that's what happens huh? that is we, we've seen the the whole parabola followed by wel welfareism is, is predictly, pre uh, uh, precisely as people were warning would be, it would demoralize people, it would stop people going to work, it would cause um, population growth amongst the most uh, feckless and irresponsible groups because they know that somehow or other they'll be rescued for the consequences of their delinquencies. It's exactly uh, as the American right were, were, were warning 40 or 50 years ago. And you, but you, but you, are, you, you totally, I mean, like um, uh, the bell curve, for example, there are certain things that... that, that Career destroying. Yes, yeah, right. The Bell Charles, Charles Murray. Yes, right. I mean, he was he was all but wiped out for certainly certainly for period. And there are other examples. By the way, just going back onto witch hunts, people who've had their careers destroyed by. Um, who was the, the the journalist who wrote a book about women? And he was a feminist at the time. And Neil Nile. Um, uh, yes. Um, yes. But we know who he was. He's going to be on the show sometime. But I, he lives in Scotland, unfortunately, and I haven't been up to Scotland recently. But I'm definitely going to going to do him. He's great. But it is. Listening to you, Kevin, and I think Johnny probably feels the same way, it, it's such a tragic waste that we've had to spend the first part of the podcast talking about your destruction of your career. I mean, just, just absolutely nuclear destruction of your career when you've got so much really interesting shit to say, really informed stuff. You should be out there fighting the fight, and it's so wrong that I'm having to do this kind of rehabilitatory... Well, God, I hope it's rehabilitatory, but it won't be. It won't uh, be. No, no, that's the point. But pray God it is. Yeah, anyway. but that's the point. There, there isn't a newspaper which, with which I could work now or for which I could work I know. because they've all contaminated themselves. They, they all joined in, in my destruction and did so with such jubilation. It yeah. wasn't regretful. We, it wasn't painful. Oh, this hurts us more than it hurts you. No, no, no. This was, this was pure sadism. Uh, they, they wanted to destroy me, and they did. And in the, in the process, they destroyed themselves. They destroyed their own credibility. They removed any large shred of decency about them. So that's the way of the media these days. I mean, and they're all in a frantic competition with social media, which they can't win. This is like a, a tank entering a, a marathon race with an Ethiopian. It will not win. It's very interesting, isn't it? The papers, I mean, they, they competed very badly with, um, you know, with, uh, with television. And then, they, of course, the Internet came along. You know, and the, te the tendency is, and you should, is to try and play on the same playing field. I remember when I, when I, when I was, you know, years ago, when we, we talked about this in the last podcast, when I was covering Iraq, they would say, I'd go to call saying, well, the TV is saying this. Why can't you? And I said, well, I don't know what the TV is saying, but these, you know, 
we can't, they're just in one particular place. I'm giving you a different kind of picture. You know, to, it, we, so newspapers cannot compete with stuff that comes out every two, you know, every two minutes. It can't compete with tweets. It has to compete in, and in other ways. And they can't compete with the bile either. No, they can't compete true. with the bile. And the, simplic, you know, and, the, and the sort of simplistic nature of the stuff that comes out on the internet. And, and the weird way that social media, for some reason, um, seems to... to, to do better with anger, doesn't it? And condemnation than it does with, with other emotions. For some reason, I mean, that, it works brilliantly. There are 180 characters or whatever it is for that. But you can't say anything that's really interesting in a tweet. Um, you can't well, bad news is always good news yes. for newspapers. So this is the, uh, a refined version of that. And you, if you take something, you can't say something kind in a few letters. I don't know how many letters go into a tweet. I've never yeah. done a tweet. I, I shall never do a tweet. Good for you. But, um, but the, the, the point is, you communicate nastiness and loathing more swiftly and more economically than you can communicate affection. It's, weird. it's, it's weird. very strange, isn't it? That here we are in the 21st century, and the quality of our, of what, you know, what people call discourse, I mean, I, our communication. Marx is called discourse. Marx, yeah, Marx, I know, and my, as you know, I'm sort of this, I have a bit of that in me, but the quality of that, of that commission is worse than it was. I mean, it's it actually is, yeah, worse. There's less understanding than it used to be. But hatred is much more powerful than love. I mean, I can kiss you, and that's yeah. not going to make much of an impact. I punch you, and you'll remember that for a very long time. Yeah. And that's the way of hatred, you know? And, 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 and hate, hate words have the same impact. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very, very special and grievously wronged guest Kevin Myers with with doing co-interviewer uh, whatever duties Johnny Foreman more in a moment Sonny Johnson brings her cutting edge conservative commentary to Sirius XM Patriot every week on Sonny's Corner. So there's one simple rule that I follow. You should always protect and defend ideas and principles, not people. People will let you down. Your ideas and your principles will keep you steady through any storms. Sunny's Corner, every Saturday at noon east on Breitbart News Saturday, Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest and much wrong guest, Kevin Myers, and my guest host, co co host, uh, Johnny Foreman. Um, we were talking about, I think, the fundamental problem that has infected our cultural dialectic. Is that the word you d use as an ex-Marxist? Um, discourse. discourse. The discourse, exactly. Um, where there seem to be two visions of the world, one of which is the vision that I think the three of us have, which is essentially based on empiricism. We, we're, we're on a quest for the truth. Um, and the other side seems not to care about truth, not to care about uh, w the example you gave of the Jewish Council of Ireland. Yes, saying that I wasn't an anti-Semite. But, but it didn't matter because there was, a, there was an alternative truth where you were near, near, near not listening. Which I think which maybe that's the, the better term, alt-truth, that they, they, they doesn't really, you also use the word empiricist, they don't need evidence for their truths because it's based entirely, their truths are conjured out of their emotions. I've always found it ironic, if that's the word, that the left was the first to start brandishing this phrase post-truth and, and, and which, which, which then mutated into fake news, when no political um, side of the argument engages more in fake news than the left. It, it, it's their meat and drink. It's what they do. And it's what they've done, used to, d to destroy me. And they destroy other people. We would, we'd, in, during the break, we were discussing uh, the fate uh, of uh, James Damore, the engineer who, who simply um, said that maybe women's um, brains are different from men's brains, and that's why they, they, they don't produce engineers. Um, and that was his, the, the woman in charge of diversity yeah. um, and strategy for, for, for Apple. Um, was it Apple or Microsoft? Um, said that his position was wrong and he was sacked. Yeah. But this is, this is insane. He was asked to give his opinion. He gave his opinion. And, <laughs> and it was then his opinion was denounced and he was sacked. This, this could have happened in Stalin's Russia or, or St 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 East, well, Eastern it, Europe. Well, it could. It could. Uh, this is, this is a, something that... Is it a function of the 
poverty of the education that people have had nowadays, where they seem not to under... For, for us, all of us here, we, we remember when the, the Iron Curtain was there. We know enough about what happened in Eastern Europe and in, in various communist re re regimes to know that it's not a good idea bringing it back. But I was looking at, the, at my internet today and there was an article from the Harvard Crimson by a by a child whose parents, I think, or grandparents had come over, had fled communist Europe. And she said, hang on a second, how come I'm at Harvard and I meet all these groups where boasting about their communist credentials and wanting to revive communism and, and put a friendly face on communism and stuff. Wake up, guys. Do you realize what you're endorsing here? So I think this is a, this is a massive cultural problem we're facing right now. Yeah, I don't understand how we have created this ignorance and it has been a, 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 it's a fake ignorance it's, a, it's cultivated ignorance about um, communism I was in Prague when Czechoslovakia became free in 1989 one of the greatest days or weeks of my life to see people actually having communism lifted from their shoulders this was an imposed tyranny twice over imposed by force of arms and these people had experienced communism and they rejoiced in their freedom and here you have all these twats in Harvard and Yale and Oxford and Cambridge who actually want to reimpose the system that when people were given the choice they rejected completely I mean it is I, I, I tend to see it as, 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 as we, we, we know people have talked about the, the baby boomer inheritance and what they, the, the bad, many of the bad things that the baby boomer generation, in the American sense, which is people born you know, in the 40s onwards, um, did, have done to society. But one is the sort of dumbing down of education and they almost have prizes thing. I mean, it really is. I don't think we've really understood how bad that's been until recently, where we now have a couple, several, a couple of generations of people who are educated but clueless and that's a new thing I mean there have been many other bad aspects of sort of baby boomer ideology but it's it's really quite scary people come out of elite especially out of elite universities yeah, that's the right thing elite, yes. they're much less tolerant than those they're much and that there's a sort of cult of the self and, and, and their own sensitivity so that um, being you know that to offend someone now it is bad to offend people but it isn't the worst thing and they've grown up in a culture in which nothing is worse than being offended and at the same time of course they believe in a kind of weird tokenism I mean the woman who got who had to leave Apple uh, Denise Young Smith she was African American and she made the mistake of saying well actually you could have 12 blonde white 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 blonde head men around a table and have and have and have and it could be a lot of there could be diversity there i.e. diverse opinions i.e. intellectual and political diversity and that was for her that, that that was the end and of course it's true because um she was what she was she was still got in terrible trouble her her race didn't protect her at all in that case and one of the funny things is that sort of the people who opposed her are people who believe in this weird essentialist idea that, that yes your opinions or your value is determined by something as arbitrary as your skin color and that's the very weird thing well this is the point you see this is that these new people these new generation they're racist they're intolerant of uh, people they they believe in apartheid they, they 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 are extraordinary they are the opposite of what they say they are they're not tolerant they believe in racial quotas they believe in just the things that the the Afrikaners believed in the the, the Bruderbond believed in just there's no difference from them in the actual practical application of the way they, they work they actually believe in, 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 in townships. They want p black people to live in townships. They want past laws. They want all the apparatus of the South African state, except it's called, what, whatever it's called, it's, it's called the modern le liberal left world. Just a, a, a brief digression. I, somebody tweeted the other day this fantastic thing. Somebody from the LSE, on, on the LSE website, some, some, some sort of uh, junior professor of sociology at somewhere obscure, had written this review of a book by Thomas Sowell, and he, he, he took apart, or so he thought, Thomas Sowell's arguments. And one of the arguments he used against Thomas Sowell was that this was typical of the author's rich white privilege. <laughs> this guy hadn't been aware that Thomas Sowell was a black man who came from the ghettos and knew whereof he spoke. It, this is, and this guy was in academe. This is where we are. This kind of gibberish, it is just unacceptable that this sort of gibberish should be uttered once, but that it is, it's a constant babble of it. This thing called white privilege. 
It's, it's a meaningless concept, and it's an insulting concept, but it's intellectually trivial, yet it passes for what we now call discourse these days. It's absurd, and it's so dangerous that it's not challenged, because it, it, it's it taking over, for example, universities in Ireland. University, Trinity College Dublin, oh, one of the most august institutions in, the Western, in Western Europe, now has safe spaces. Yeah. So this is this bizarreness that actually takes concrete form. It's not just in brains. People seek they see the American thing, for example, the horrible thing, Black Friday, which has no meaning here, but it's all over the place in Ireland, perhaps in Britain too. So we copy the, the um, American things and we do so brainlessly, and we do it, do, do so ineptly. But the consequences can uh, can be and often is ruinous. Yes, that's one of those very interesting things that's happened actually in the last in the last decade where you know even though people imagine that American influence has become less in Britain and in Ireland you've got yeah Black Friday Halloween's become a big thing high school proms it's very it's fascinating that yes, isn't it, it is. how, and as you say these things these these the when they are when these cultural fashions are imported it is often done ineptly so and when it's forms of political correctness it's often much worse when it gets to the British Isles than it is than, than it was even in, in its originating homeland and you see we safe spaces came over very quickly from the US for example yes uh, Halloween of course in Ireland has always been commemorated but the Halloween in Ireland uh, has been Americanized the whole trick or treat it wasn't trick or treating it was it was, yeah, a, no, it was exactly. a religious thing it was, it? it was always always part of it it was it was the autumn the mid-autumn festival it, the, Guy Fawkes was um, England's mid-autumn festival yes. and uh, Halloween was Scotland and Ireland's mid-autumn festival. All societies have a festival in, in mid-autumn. Just Post harvest. And, and, yes, exactly. And yeah. pumpkins, because of course yeah, that was exactly the time that. Of. And uh, so we have you. Know, it's a, 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 a sequence in all society. You have a midwinter one called, we call Christmas. It used to be called Saturnalia. You have a, a, a spring festival which we call Easter, which you do with rebirth and so on yes. and so forth. But these are predictable things. But they have now been Americanized. All of these festivals oh, have been Americanized. I mean, the whole and, Santa Claus yeah. thing came back, for, didn't it? Yes. A very strange. Yeah. But uh, th I can live with all that. It's infuriating yeah. to see this brainless Black Black Friday stuff. But what is not tolerable is the impoverishment of our political culture by importing American terms from uh, a society which has got enduring and will always have in enduring racial problems. Why on earth, w w where we didn't have race, uh, we didn't have slavery in Ireland, essentially England did not have mass slavery, it's not an issue. Post-slavery societies have deep problems. Why should we in, in, in import their vocabulary and their concepts in a society with a completely different history? That, that's what we're doing so slavishly. It is pathetic. It's, it's spineless. It, it's, it's completely bankrupt of any moral or intellectual um, principle. And all, the, all of this stuff, of course, reduces human complexity and individuality, doesn't it? You know, you are no more than your race. You're no more than, you know, you think like a white person or a black person thinks, which is an astonishing... That is astonishing crude. because that's the kind of thing that the most, the people would, I mean, for example, the man, the man who would have rejected that would have been Nelson Mandela. He, he wouldn't even have begun to understand what, so what you've... And or, Martin Luther King Martin would be telling Luther everyone in his grave. Yeah, that, and, you know, and Martin Luther King talked about black children, white children, Protestant children and Jewish children. I mean, he specified all these concepts as not as being as being alien to what he had in mind. And we should, that we should be judged on the content of our character, not yes. our not our gender or our race or any of those things. It's extraordinary that the left has become it's all become yeah, these, these, these are essential the categories. Yeah, the people who, who who purport to revere uh, the legacy of Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela are in fact uh, revering um, the the concepts of the Ku Klux Klan and the Bruder Bond uh, and all of the racial divisions and all of the culture of apartheid. It's extraordinary but they don't think and I think they don't think they've got the equipment to think they have been robbed of the vocabulary and the mental machinery that can enable to get through the verbiage which clogs their brains so how do we claw it back because we're now living in a culture where okay you are you were at least the soundest most articulate undoubtedly the best in my view journalist in the whole of Ireland and they took you out on the basis of a sentence in an article you wrote. Now, you've got, this is not quite the same, but there was a recent example of this organization called, um, what's the, uh, the, 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 the organization that campaigned against the Daily Mail and the Express and the Sun, um, something Hope against, Hope something against, Hope not, and it's not Hope Not Hate, it's the other one, isn't it? It's, um, anyway, they, 
they managed to persuade Paper Chase um, that they should dissociate them, uh, a, a, a stationery a stationary shop that they should uh, dissociate themselves from the, from the stop funding hate. Uh, this 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 left wing pressure group managed to persuade a a, a, a business that they should should not um, have anything to do with the Daily Mail, should not advertise them in the, in the more anything because the Daily Mail's politics were, was, was wrong and anathema. What I'm saying is that the left is very su 